Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a talk show podcast on the Beatles called Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly show in which we talk about anything that we feel like about the Beatles, their history, their music, their past, the present, maybe sometimes the future. We get into the news. We get into everything. We get into the minutia right here on this show. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this program. You might know me for my syndicated Beatles radio program called Every Little Thing. Also, another talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast all about the solo Beatles. And also my own YouTube channel with loads of conversations on the Fab Four, which is called Ken Michaels Radio. And I'm being joined by my two regulars, first of all, a man who has written a number of books on the Beatles, including From the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. He also uh, was the Beatles man at uh, the New York Times for many years, working in their classical department. And he is currently working on a series of books on Paul McCartney called The McCartney Legacy, the first volume of which is due out in November, along with his co-author, Adrian Sinclair. And that is Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, Darren. Hello, everyone. Yeah, Alan. And also we have Darren DeVivo, who has been a part of New York Radio for almost 40 years at New York's WFUV. He's done a lot of great programming through the years, a lot of Beatles specials as well. He's always a joy to have on our show. And it's a miracle that we pried him away from City Field right now as we speak, since he's a big Mets fan, as am I. And so let's welcome Darren. Hi, Darren. Let's go Mets. Hi, everyone. Hi, Alan. Hi, Ken. How are you? It's great to be here. And, and, and you point out it's been about a month since our last show here. So it's great to be back uh, doing our thing as on things we said today. Yeah. And um, on today's show, we're going to be doing a show on Wings. Looking back on the history of Wings, our thoughts on the band, um, and listing... Uh, our top favorite studio albums from Wings, as well as our top 10 favorite Wings songs. And then we'll get into more of a conversation as to our thoughts on the band, whether or not we feel they were a true band, a collaborative band, and maybe even asking each other the question as to whether or not they deserve to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. This is all very debatable, but it's always a ton of fun. Everybody's got their own opinion, and I'd love to hear what my two co-hosts have to say about it. But as uh, we just mentioned, this is our first show in about a month. And as you might have imagined, a ton of news <laughs> has accumulated in all that time. So we're going to try to get to all of it. It may take a while, but um, this is all worthwhile stuff to find out about. First of all, in the last uh, day, or, day or so... Um, We've been hearing unconfirmed reports that the DVD Blu-ray for Get Back has been canned for a release or delayed. Um, it's hard for me to believe that it won't come out at all. It's just my personal feeling, and I have nothing to back this up, that it's probably being delayed. I'm hoping, I think we're all hoping, so that there'll be an extended version of the movie to come out later in the year. What do you guys feel about this? You've heard the reports. Do you think that there won't be a release or do you just think that the delay is for this specific reason? Alan? Um, I've heard that, um, well, I, I mean, I asked a, a, a retailer that I know and he says he's heard nothing about the delay. The report about the delay came from, I believe, Australia said it was delayed in Australia and possibly other places too. So here we haven't heard anything about it. It's supposed to come out in June. Um, haven't heard that it isn't. Um, I'd be fine with it not coming out um, immediately because I really do think they need to rethink that idea about not having any bonus materials. There's all kinds of things they can do. And to just put it out as it was on TV, we all have copies of that. Buy it anyway, but 
we'd feel a lot better about it if it had extra materials. Apparently, Disney doesn't believe in this kind of thing. And um, that's just too bad. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Darren, what do you think? Uh, I was suspicious about the delay from the first, uh, from, from the beginning when there was some technical issue with, um, uh, with, the, with the discs or with the way they were manufactured. You go through all of that in this day and age, there was no technical issue. I think the problem is uh, secretly behind closed doors. As Alan said, there's talk about what to do with the release, whether it's going to be straight, um, you know, what, what was available on Disney Plus, straight to disc. Are they going to add bonus material? How much bonus material? What bonus material? Is Peter Jackson involved? The impression we get from having spoken with Peter is that he's not involved in this part of it at all. No. Um, is there something going on with Apple and Disney where they're trying to work out something that could involve Let It Be? I guess at this point, anything is possible. Right. Uh, I've read both that the delay was now... Uh, I don't recall the last time I heard a specific month being mentioned as a new release date. Um, Alan mentioned June. Um, I've heard indefinitely, you know, on hold. I've heard canceled. To me, the canceled part sounds a little like, you know, um, kind of a panicky uh, reaction of fans. I think it'll happen but who knows when. And uh, I think it would, you know, I remember when they announced it so soon after the premiere, um, we thought that was kind of strange. Mm -hmm. So fast, something that we were hoping would happen all of a sudden is going to happen in, in light, you know, at, at lightning uh, speed. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, even that seemed a little strange. Right. And it actually seemed like it was a little bit of a kind of a thrown together thing too, you know, just no bonus material, very little in the way of packaging. Maybe guys, you want to rethink this. And, and I think that's what's going on right now. It's being rethought and they're not agreeing and they're not moving. They're moving at a snail's pace. I think it'll happen. Um, we know but, that uh, Peter Jackson has the plans to petition and ask for more material. And maybe there was a flood of fans that did so. Maybe mm -hmm. that had an effect. But it makes a lot of sense to me, thinking commercially here, that this would be a nice package to put out before Christmas. Yeah, That's that could be the other thing. I mean, there may be too many, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe there are too many hands in, involved in this and they're not seeing eye to eye with stuff. Who knows? But I still think it'll happen. Now, some people actually have copies of it. They got their pre-orders. There were physical copies that did get made, manufactured, ready to go, and got sent out, which I don't know how that could happen. But uh, there were some people that have it, and I haven't heard anyone say specifically what this technical problem was, what the issue was. Um, what I've I don't heard know is that um, heard. that they screwed up the surround sound version. Um, that that didn't come out right, or it, it just was stereo or whatever. But um, it was a quality control issue, according to someone who um, has worked closely with this, who was who I can't identify. Um, <clears throat> but quality control was it. And, uh, you know, also some turned up in stores. Um, some turned up at Target, and if you tried to buy it, um, they would tell you you couldn't. Apparently, you also couldn't steal it. I mean, if it's, a, if it's not for sale, you should have just been able to walk out with it. But um, that w apparently wasn't uh, in the cards either. It mm -hmm. sounds like from the beginning, somebody jumped the gun. Can't re it can't be one person, obviously, but... They were not on the same page, whether they being Disney alone or Disney and others. Uh -huh. Some they were not on the same page, seeing eye to eye, and something happened too fast. And so now while they sort it all out, you know, uh, do is there any way to does anyone know uh, 
how you know like the 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 ratings version of what do we know how well how many people watched it is there is there statistics ratings for things on disney plus i remember there were reports for an older demographic that it did fairly well i don't remember the exact numbers so yeah but um we'll have to wait and see you know as soon as we hear more news about this we'll pass it along here on this show all right um we're doing this show on april the 21st in exactly one week it will be the start of paul mccartney's got back tour Hmm. his first show is going to be at the spokane arena in spokane washington for me like all tours the most interesting thing is going to be what the changes will be if at all and i certainly hope there will be several in the set list but we'll know more the week from today so speaking of tours ringo Starr just announced the second leg of his all-star band tour <clears throat> this will follow the first leg which will start on may 27th with the first of two dates at the casino uh, rama in ontario and wrap up june 26th at ruth eckert hall in clearwater florida now the second leg will begin September 23rd at the Hartford Healthcare Amphitheater in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Without a doubt, the one concert that is closest to my house <laughs> from any Beatle, although there was a show in Wallingford, Connecticut, that's kind of equal in distance, but uh, 10 minutes from my house, and I got tickets already for that. Um, the second leg will end with two dates in Mexico City. October 19th and 20th at the National Auditorium. The second leg will include 19 concerts in just under a month. What is most surprising to me is that Ringo will be doing a total of seven more concerts in Canada, hitting Montreal, Kingston, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and two dates in British Columbia. Add that to the 22 dates from the first leg at Ringo at the age of 81, turning 82 in July, will be doing a total, so far, of 41 concerts. How active can you be at that age? That's pretty amazing. Speaking of Ringo, it was just announced that his recent book of photos of the Beatles, some from his private collection, some that were taken off the internet called Lifted, will have what is now being called the Celestial Edition coming out. <clears throat> this is the final edition of the book, and uh, from what I've read, uh, the differences being that um, these books and the pressings uh, before it, between these books and the pressings before it, is that each copy is signed by Ringo and it comes in a slipcase. The price for the book is $599. And all the proceeds go to benefit Ringo's charity, the Lotus Foundation. Uh, you can order the book exclusively through Julian's Auctions. One of the many new albums that Ringo appears on for his drumming is the tribute album to the late guitarist Johnny Winter put together by his brother Edgar. The album is called Brother Johnny and Ringo drums on the song Stranger, which features Michael McDonald on lead vocals and Joe Walsh on guitar. The Grammy Awards took place on Sunday night, April the 3rd. And Paul and George were nominated in different categories. Paul had two nominations and lost to both. For best rock song, Paul's Find My Way from his McCartney 3 album was nominated and lost out to the Foo Fighters song, Waiting on a War. Paul's McCartney 3 was also nominated for best rock album, but also lost out to the Foo Fighters for their latest Medicine at Midnight album. <clears throat> However, George Harrison was nominated in the category for Best Boxed or Special Limited Edition Package for All Things Must Pass, 50th edition, 50th anniversary edition, and won the prize for that category. Uh, with Darren Evans, Danny, and Olivia Harrison listed as art directors, Olivia was there at the ceremony accepting the award, and she said, congratulations to Danny Harrison for driving the reissue, Paul Hicks for remixing 70 tracks, and to the entire team for their love and hard work, to George for giving us the opportunity to revel in your music, which is full of hope, compassion, and rock and roll. It should also be pointed out that in the best rock song category, another song was nominated with a Beatle connection, and that was Weezer's All My Favorite Songs. 
which was co-written by Ilse Juber, the daughter of Lawrence and Hope Juber. Lawrence, of course, being the last guitarist in Wings. More news here about George. Now, Ultimate Classic Rock is reporting that in honor of George's classic album, All Things Must Pass, the cannabis company Dadgrass has announced a special line of products called All Things Must Grass. This collection includes pre-rolled joints, rolling papers, a rolling tray, posters, buttons, pins, matches, and stickers. A special dad stash edition disguises the pack of joints to look like a double cassette version of All Things Must Pass. This is in fact a collaboration with the Harrison Estate, making it the first cannabis partnership with any of the Beatles. A press release from Dadgrass says that the joints are crafted from a mix of organic CBD and CBG hemp. Now, Ben Starmer, who is the co-founder and CEO of Dadgrass says, we tend to shy away from the high test, blow your mind weed that kids are into today. For this project, we set out to create a mellower kind of joint, something that blended together the type of high quality, low potency and all natural flower that was around when George was having a laugh back in the early 70s. Just a classic smoke or a classic bloke. End of quote. Uh, so how, how, did, how, did, how didn't Paul get there first? That's what I wanted. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, interesting product, to say the least. How do you guys feel about this coming up? Great. I, I think <laughs> we, should, we should do a show um, under the influence and see, uh, you know, what, you know, the sure. three of us. I mean, it could, it could be like brilliant or an absolute disaster. But I, I don't know. It, <laughs> it's legal now. So that's, yeah. you know, what's the difference between... Bob Dylan's uh, line of bourbon and, you know, this. Mm -hmm. There's no difference. Um, I think it's, I don't know what to think, honestly, of it. It's, it's, it's unprecedented. It's, well, there, there is a difference. This, one, this won't give you a hangover. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I guess, oh, why not? You know what? No, Paul really missed an opportunity here. You know, he could have been, they could have reconstructed that um, interview with Father Guido Sarducci and, you know, they, they really could have marketed the hell out of this. Uh, it, it would have been perfect. I mean, in volume one of McCartney Legacy, he's busted twice. In volume two, he'll be busted again and put in jail. You know, and, and this is his opportunity to say, see, and now it's legal. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I think that um, I think we found our first sponsor for the show. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Absolutely. You know, on my other podcast show on Talk More Talk, they were kind of mixed about this, mainly because George died from having cancer from smoking. Yeah, of but course, that's, that's nicotine cigarette. and stuff. You know, there's no nicotine in. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, theoretically. Well, it's still smoking. I was going to say, theoretically, he didn't have to be a big smoke or secondhand smoke, hand cut, but that's still smoking. So I don't know. I don't know. I just because it's un, it's like I don't I don't know what to think of it myself. So. Fine. You know, right. let's let's well, let my enthusiasm for it carry the both of you. <laughs> I think that our opinion would be much clearer. And if we were, if, if the dad grass folks uh, maybe sent us some promotional items to, mm -hmm. uh, you know. That is an excellent idea, Darren. Write that down. I Can we get some you. promo pot, please? The two of you come up with the best ideas. <laughs> promo pot. <laughs> Yeah, they'll have All to right. be because if uh, if if I if we end up um, smoking it, I'm also going to have to have a mint copy for the collection. So have to you know get a few of them. Hmm. Then we let then we let your cats Alan run around in the background during the show, and it'll be like you know. <laughs> anyway, three cool cats. 
This, before this show goes to pot, why don't you continue, Ken? <laughs> well, we have more on the George front. The new book from Olivia Harrison called Came the Lightning, 20 Poems for George will be coming out June 21st. <clears throat> there will be a $35 hardcover edition from Genesis Publications and a forward from Martin Scorsese. There will be a limited edition of 1,500 copies and they have a distinction between the two. The first 1,000 are called the um, collector copies and they have a pre-order price of 100 and 110 pounds. And then there is the special edition one, which is 500 copies and that's 285 pounds. Okay, and the special edition is supposed to have a signed book and what else here? A selection of photographs and mementos curated by Olivia, including pictures of herself and George to accompany the 20 poems. If you need more information or you wanna order this, you can go to genesispublications.com. There is a hyphen in between Genesis and publications. Um, we have lots of news concerning Julian Lennon, who has just released two new songs on April the 8th, what was his 59th birthday. And they are now available on all streaming platforms. And his forthcoming album will be called Jude, which is a nod to the song, Hey Jude, which of course Paul McCartney wrote to comfort Julian because of his parents, John and Cynthia, going through a separation. By the way, those two new songs from Julian are called Every Little Moment and Freedom. Julian says many of these songs from the new album have been in the works for several years. So it almost feels like a coming of age album with great respect for the overwhelming significance of the song, Hey Jude, written for me. The title Jude, conveys the very real journey of my life that these tracks represent. Julian just signed a global recordings agreement deal with BMG, to which Julian said, after working on new music for the past few years, I am happy to have found the perfect partner in BMG to help bring this light to work. Julian's last album, Everything Changes, dates back to 2011. And what's been getting quite a bit of attention concerning Julian is a new performance of his father's iconic song, Imagine, accompanied by Nuno Betancourt on guitar. A video was made with Julian singing the song perfectly. Really great vocals from him. And this is for Global Citizen Stand Up for Ukraine and to get people to donate to the cause. Okay, uh, the video that Julian made for Imagine has already gotten over 2 million views. Speaking of the war on Ukraine, there is a brand new cover version of the Beatle classic Come Together by a super group of talent in the alternative music field. The act is being called Lifeline International and it includes members of the groups Ramstein, Faith No More, Stabbing Westward, The Hard Kiss, they're a band from Ukraine, Gravity Kills, and Lisa Kay. This recording is the brainchild of COP, COP International Records founder Christian Petke. The single is now available on the records, the record company's Bandcamp page, and will soon be followed on many major digital music services. It's already available to listen to on YouTube. Look up Come Together, parentheses, We Will Stop You. And there they're doing, they're changing, We Will Rock You from Queen to We Will Stop You. And the artist, again, is Lifeline International. And 100% of the proceeds will be donated to UNICEF. Uh, next, we have the happy news that Zach Starkey, Ringo's first son, just got married to his partner of 18 years, Australian singer Sharna Shh-Leguiz, <laughs> and uh, it's SSH. There was uh, an intimate moment on Monday, March 21st at the Sunset Marquee in West Hollywood with Father Ringo in attendance. Zach, who's now 56, and Leguiz, 37, decided to wed on the date of their one-year-old daughter, Luna's birthday. The newlyweds issued a statement to People magazine. After 18 years together, Luna's umbilical cord kind of tied the knot, but we wanted to make it official and share with our friends and family in the US before doing the same in Jamaica and the UK. Guess who served as best man at the ceremony? Eddie Vedder and Smith's guitarist, Johnny Marr. 
reggae singer Pato Bontone officiated the wedding of the pair. So congratulations to uh, Zach there and Sharna. Sean Lennon was just in Liverpool to open a new University of Liverpool Yoko Ono Lennon Center that was back on March 25th. Located on the corner of Grove Street and Oxford Street, it's described as a new world-class culture center, which will house teaching facilities and the Tongue Auditorium, the university's state-of-the-art 400-seat concert hall. Sean, who is now 46, unveiled the plaque within the center to mark its official open. Yoko Ono first issued the statement when the building's name was announced. I am thrilled to be recognized with the naming of the new performance center at the University of Liverpool. Thank you to the university and to the people of Liverpool for this wonderful honor. And Sean Lennon was quoted as saying, used to, they used to say behind every great man was a great woman, but my parents famously stood beside each other as equals couple of sentences there that uh, pack a lot of punch. Very well put there from Sean. There's a new biopic on John Lennon coming and it's nearing its pre-production launch. It is still untitled, but it would be the first authorized big screen biography of John and it's produced by Yoko and Sean Lennon. Julian is said to be on board and so are the surviving Beatles. Anthony McCartan, who wrote the huge hit about Freddie Mercury and Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody has finished the screenplay and it is all set. The movie will have mainly John solo songs, but will have five key John Beatles songs. The film is supposed to cover his entire life, his youth, his time with the Beatles, and his time separated from Yoko and being with Mei Pang. Next step is to find a director and an actor to play John, not to mention other key roles like the other Beatles, Yoko, Brian Epstein, Cynthia Lennon, and others. Speaking of May Pang, she has a new documentary film coming out called The Lost Weekend, A Love Story, which will be shown at the Tribeca Film Festival. Their website says, with unbelievable access to rich archival footage, rarely heard home recordings, and a collection of Lennon's own quirky, evocative sketches, famed writer and music executive May Pang takes us on a deeply emotional journey through the 18 months that would shape her life and reinvigorate one of the greatest figures in music. The film includes interviews with Alice Cooper, Apple Records manager Tony King, and Jim Keltner. The festival runs from June 8th through the 19th. So presumably, I would think there would be some kind of DVD release or Blu-ray release after that. Um, of course, this is not news anymore. Some of this news feels like it truly is old, but um, we do have to report on the passing of Taylor Hawkins, the drummer for the Foo Fighters. Taylor actually sang lead vocals on their song, Sunday Rain from their Concrete and Gold album. And Paul McCartney actually drummed on that song from the Foo Fighters. It was Paul who inducted the band to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in their last ceremony. Hawkins joined the Foo Fighters in 1997 Following the departure of the band's previous drummer, William Goldsmith, and before joining the Foo Fighters, he played drums for Alanis Morissette. The band was in the middle of a festival tour in South America and had plans of performing at the Grammy Awards and begin a new tour of North America in May. On March 30th, Paul McCartney wrote on Instagram, Taylor's sudden death came as a shock to me and the people who knew and loved him. Not only was he a great drummer, but his personality was big and shiny and will be sorely missed by all who were lucky to live and work beside him. I was asked by the Foo Fighters to play on one of their tracks. It turned out that they wanted me to play drums on one of Taylor's songs. This request came from a group with two amazing drummers. It was an incredible session and cemented my relationship with Taylor and the guys. Later, they asked if I would induct them into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I sang with them on Get Back, Taylor provided a powerhouse drum part. I'll never forget that night, all of which made it much more of a desperately sad shock to hear he had died. So thanks Taylor for sharing some glorious minutes with me. You were a true rock and roll hero and will always remain in my heart. God bless his family and band, love Paul. And Ringo Starr wrote, God bless Taylor, peace and love to all his family. And Elton John called him one of the greatest drummers and a true musician.
Taylor Hawkins was only 50 years old. Okay. Um, we mentioned Lawrence Juber earlier. My other podcast show, Talk More Talk, just did a great interview with him at the Fest for Beatle Fans. And Lawrence has a brand new CD out, which is called Select Blends, made up of 16 songs that he performed live online during COVID on his Facebook page. Lawrence had weekly features, which were called Tea Time with LJ, and you got to see him at his home performing a set of songs, all very enjoyable. He handpicked 16 tracks, one of which is a cover of George's Within You Without You, and another one, John's Jealous Guy among other favorites, including the Monkees' Pleasant Valley Sunday and the Rolling Stones' Paint It Black and several of his own compositions. You can find out more at Lawrence's own website at lawrencejuber.com. Just a few more news items left. Some very upsetting news coming out of Newcastle where the legendary drummer of the band, yes, Alan White, is reporting that three thieves have stolen special mementos of rock and roll history, including personal documents at his home. Many of them have been returned, but one that hasn't is the actual drum set that Alan played on for the sessions for All Things Must Pass and Imagine. Alan let other rock musicians play on that very scene. If anyone has information about this drum set, please call 911. Some news about the Quarrymen. There'll be an event at the Liverpool Beatles Museum on Matthew Street. That's on August the 28th. You can hear from the surviving members who were there where it all started and on the day when John met Paul. And then finally, there's a new film in the works called Prefab, which tells the story of the Quarian Men's drummer, Colin Hatton. Yeah. Add in the Fest for Beatles fans program booklet says, one man, his drums, and the band that became the Beatles, coming soon. It has already premiered at the Florida Film Festival. The film is being made by a Florida-based filmmaker, Todd Thompson, and it includes appearances from Paul McCartney, uh, Peter Asher, Mark Lewison, the old gray whistle test, Bob Harris, and Billy Bragg. To find out more, you can visit the film's website, which is prefabthemovie.com. And that's it. <laughs> the last uh, a month's worth of news right there, packed together right here on our show. Great job, Ken. <laughs> Thank you. Been waiting to get these out there. Um, so our show this time out is all about wings. And uh, I thought we'd have a conversation here to discuss what our thoughts are about those years in the 70s when Paul did so well on the charts with his singles and albums with the band Wings. And um, even ask my two colleagues here whether or not that part of Paul's post Beatles career should be considered separate from everything else. But um, let me get your thoughts on this first, Darren, because I know certainly you've expressed here on this show how much you love the whole Wings period. And you have a real deep connection to that time because in many ways that was your start in loving Paul McCartney's music, which led to also loving the Beatles music as well. So what are your thoughts as to whether or not you feel in that one decade there, when Wings released seven studio albums, a live album, had so much success, whether or not you feel they were a true band, and also, in your opinion, what constitutes what is a real band? Um, like you said, Wings, Wings provided me with the soundtrack to my youth. Um, I was born in 65, so you know I, I took to music, and I don't know why, I don't know what the draw was, what pulled me in, but uh, I became a fan of music for far back. I, I think it's four years old, 69, and it was always the Beatles. And McCartney immediately was my favorite Beatle. Why? I don't know how it worked out that way. So as I was growing up, Wings were one of the biggest acts in music. Um, so, you know, yeah, they mean so much to me. And those albums and those singles and those hits and the B-sides, those songs, I can remember where I was when I heard them for the first time, where I bought the records. Um, 
you know, going to grammar school with all my notebooks with the wings W I would draw, you know, and everyone in the seventies had the kiss logo all over the place. And, um, yes. And Led Zeppelin. And I had wings, the big W, um, yeah, they were a real band. And, and, and the only time that I ever started to hear doubts about that was when, you know, when I was older and in more recent years, skeptics wanted to di dismiss them, uh, which never really totally made any sense to me because they were a band. Uh, you know, McCartney had uh, a drummer and he had a guitarist he was playing with and Denny Lane uh, made some some contributions to the to the mix and Denny and Linda, I think were responsible for one of the band's trademarks. It was the harmonies. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they managed to have a distinct sound thanks to Denny Lane and Linda McCartney's harmonies, which was a signature uh, to, to uh, the wing sound. Um, and I always thought of them as a band and they wouldn't be the first band to um, have to deal with a lot of turnover and personnel changes. You mentioned yes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, from their second album. Yes. Following their second album, they were they were losing members, gaining members, members coming back. Um, so McCartney had uh, had to hire a bunch of drummers and lead, lead guitarists. So what? Um, they always were a band. And um, who knows what would have happened had Paul not been arrested in Japan uh, in January 80. Um, quite likely Wings would have continued at least for a little while longer. Um, so, you know, I, I, I feel very strongly about Wings being um, similar to Solo Paul, but their own entity. Um, and I've been saying that they should go into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for years now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you don't hear a lot of that. Uh, a lot of that talk, but uh, uh, yeah, there definitely were a, 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 a band. And it was Paul's attempt, whether he could do it or not, it was Paul's attempt at starting, uh, going back to square one and capturing uh, the experiences he had when he joined the Quarrymen. A band starting from the bottom up, building uh, as they went. And he wanted that experience a second time. Uh, after the Beatles broke up. So um, can you do it when you're a superstar? Can you, can you really go back to square one? Not really, but you could try. And I think that's how, how it happened for Wings. That's how Wings came together. And um, Paul did everything uh, the right way there. Started with the, you know, uh, musicians that he hadn't played with much. Uh, Denny Sywell had just played drums on Ram. Mm -hmm. Linda's musical abilities were very limited. And uh, yet they were going to live together for a bit and jam and cook up some songs and go out on the road and rough it and sort of, you know, redo the whole, you know, school band starting out type thing. Uh, and pulled it off pretty well so i don't know you know you know I, I i have a soft spot in my heart you know for that period and and like i've said in past shows i was more tuned into wings than i were the beatles because wings were current wings were happening at that time i was very much into charts and billboard and american top 40 and to me it was the 70s were Bee Gees, Kiss, um, Chicago, Elton John, mm -hmm. Wings. Right. You, you know, it wasn't, you know, oh, Paul McCartney and this other group. Mm -hmm. And Did I think they were the biggest selling act band of the decade. If you, well, no, the Bee Gees. Um, but if you took like Elton John out of the picture and any solo artists, Wings were one or two for the entire decade. Well, certainly in terms of hit records, you've got yeah. those were the top three for the second. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Um, yeah. Do you consider Paul McCartney's current band 
a band in the sense that Wings was? And if not, why not? I don't because Paul never kind of, Paul never presents them as, uh, as a band with a name and an identity and he'll record without them. Uh, he'll do some recording with them. Mm -hmm. uh, their presence in the studio is not necessary to a McCartney recording. If they were a band, right? If they yeah. were a band in the sense of a band, they would be playing on everything on McCartney three. Well, maybe not McCartney three, but Egypt station and, uh, and memory almost full and new. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when wings went into the studio, it was Paul, Linda, Denny Lane and whatever era you're talking about, guitarist and drummer, lead guitarist and drummer. Paul didn't decide to record Band on the Run by himself and put it out as a Wings album. Denny and Denny and Linda were there, uh, you know, supporting him, backing him up. Um, so, yeah, you made some good points there, and I do think in many ways he did start out square one. I mean, he, he had the advantage of him being Paul McCartney, no matter what, but he still, he could have started out playing stadiums if yeah, he wanted. He could, have, he could have started out with his own all-star band concept right? to play live. And he, he had said he never wanted to do that. He didn't want this to be a band of egos. He didn't want to be part of a band of superstars already established. Mm -hmm. um, I always looked at Wings as being... Paul never knew what it was to be a solo artist. He had always been in a band. He had always been in, in a brotherhood of musicians. Uh, so when it came time to start over again, he realized, listen, I like to play live. I like the band experience, the camaraderie. You know, I want there to be a band again as, you know, he, he, because he's Paul McCartney, it can't be. It's impossible mm. to do the Quarrymen too. But the next best thing, I think he pulled off and, uh, and took it from there. Would you also say that part of the reason why you listened to Wings albums was to hear contributions from Denny Lane? Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. I know some people were like, you know, will kind of brush aside wings at the speed of sound because each member had a, a vocal. To me, that justifies it. Mm -hmm. At least it did back then. Not so much now. I don't really think of it much like that anymore. But back in the day, it was a natural. And, and, and it didn't, it didn't, I didn't, um, I was 11 when wings at the speed of sound came out. It didn't, it, it didn't phase me in the least that the other members of the band got a lead vocal. Mm -hmm. and then he had a few already um, that had come before. And um, I loved it, you know, and, uh, and maybe I missed it in a way later in the 70s. But um, no, I thought I thought that was great. And I think that uh, justifies I would have think I probably would have liked to have seen. I don't know what the working dynamic was within the band, but I probably would have liked to have seen more Denny Lane. Um, whether that was a Denny didn't have the material or, or there wasn't, Paul didn't provide him with the room for his material to be heard. I don't know. Uh, well, if you, you know, if you look at the London Sound album, there's five co-writes between Paul and Denny Lane, Denny singing lead on two songs. Um, but yeah, I know there was one interview I did with Denny Lane where he said Paul was always encouraging him to write material for the band. So, you know, um, I'll, I'll say my feelings on the subject, but I want to hear from Alan. One more quick thing. about, And then the question about Linda and her role in the band and should she have been there? And did she kind of make Wings um, maybe a uh, lesser band? Uh, I've never heard one of the other members of Wings speak negatively about her presence. In fact, Lawrence Juber has spoken very positively about Linda's role within the band. Um, you know, she may have been limited uh, with her musical abilities, but she, she knew the bare minimum to be able to go up there and play keyboards in a rock band. Uh, and, and her role, you know, was more to be the 
power supply for Paul. And in that case, uh, she wouldn't be the first musician in a band that played a minimal role uh, within the group or maybe a role that was more significant behind the scenes. We've seen bands have lyricists considered as band members. Keith Reed, Procol Harum, um, Peter Sinfield, early King Crimson. They were lyricists, but they were band members. And here Linda was McCartney's support line and she could handle, you know, the basics on keyboards. And like I said at the beginning, it was Linda and Denny's harmonies uh, that gave Wings uh, one of their key signature sounds. So to defend Linda a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I kind I of poo poo on those skeptics. Yeah. Um, Alan, what are your thoughts about this? Um, well, first, I, I have a, a couple of comments on, on the things Darren said. What One is about those harmonies. I, it wasn't just Linda and Denny. Paul was in there, too. And, um, yeah, yeah. you know, and yeah. in fact, if you, you know, Ram, there is no Denny and the harmonies on that are very much what we think of now as Wings harmonies. Um, <clears throat> in terms of Wings band members speaking negatively about Linda, um, he didn't talk a lot, but he was pretty vocal about this. And that was Henry, Henry McCulloch was really felt and said several times, particularly within the band, but even publicly that he, that he felt that Linda was holding them back. Um, but most of the others were a lot more diplomatic than Henry was. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Henry was one of these guys who, um, possibly fueled by whatever he was drinking, was really a straight shooter and would tell you exactly what was on his mind. Um, so, so there were just those two caveats, generally speaking, you know, don't disagree with you. Um, whether I think it's a band or not, um, I mean, I basically do. <laughs> Um, the records came out um, attributed to Wings. They toured as Wings. Um, but I don't make that much of a distinction between um, the current band and Wings as a band. I think the current band is a fantastic band and he just didn't give it a name. And it's true, doesn't have them on the albums, which sort of surprises me in a way. Um, but, you know, Denny Lane, uh, after Band on the Run came out, Denny Lane basically said, this isn't a Wings album, really. It's a Paul and Linda album. I was just there as a utility guy, you know. But Denny, you know, Denny's a weird duck. Um, <laughs> depending when you get him in an interview, he will either be totally gung-ho on the band concept and, you know, wanting to participate as a songwriter and all that. Um, or he will be, you know, sort of depressed about it, you know, like, uh, yeah, I'm just there, I, you know, I'm there doing stuff, but I'm, it's, it's really Paul and Linda. It's not, you know, really a band. And, and I don't know, you know, Paul wants, Paul's encouraging me to do more songs, but I haven't got any songs. I mean, he said that in an interview that I haven't got any material while he was promoting his Alain album, a new album of new material of his. He actually sat there and said, I haven't got any material. So I don't know. Um, you know, you can't really take everything he says. Um, you know, it's it, it, well, you have to take it with a couple of pounds of salt sometimes, um, yeah. you know, and yet. Having said that, you know, he may have been depressed about his role or the finances or various things. But as as Darren said, I mean, he was part of that vocal sound. Um, and there were things like, you know, no words. Uh, the very first thing that um, he is listed as a collaborator on. And before before they went to do Band on the Run, when they were doing that tour of Britain in 73, Paul was saying in interviews, you know, and I don't want to push him too much. I don't want to, you know, force it or embarrass him, but I'd really like Denny to start doing some more writing. And, you know, we'd like to do some of Denny's stuff. You know, Paul put it together as a band. He wanted it to be a band. 
but there was that impulse that in a way was a problem for him within the Beatles, which is also wanting it to be his own way. And if you're in a band, you know, with the Beatles, that was harder because you had three equally strong personalities sometimes pushing back, or at least two of them were pushing back. Um, with Wings, these guys were on salary, you know, they were a hired band. Now you can, the salary thing is really complicated um, because, you know, in a way that makes them probably like the current band more than say any other band we know where they split things. Um, but if you keep in mind that um, for quite a while, uh, uh, really until maybe 75, um, all of Paul's income from recordings, including Wings recordings and the first two solo recordings were going right into Apple and not coming out. You know, he couldn't get them. Um, and so having the band on salary was a way that they could be paid something um, while all that money is still all tied up, you know? Um, <clears throat> so it, it's very, it's very complicated whether it was a band or not. I mean, I kind of think, it, I think of it as a band. We're, we're talking about a specific body of music from wildlife through back to the egg those seven studio albums um, as Wings albums. And, you know, as, as Darren said, there were personnel changes for various reasons. Um, and there are in other bands too. Um, but I, 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 think, I think of them as a band, um, but with an asterisk, you know, like Roger Maris' 61 Homelands. Um, you know, there's, <laughs> there's, there's, it's not so straightforward that it doesn't need, a, you know, some caveats and explanations. Did that oh, answer I'm the sure. question? What was the question? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure if we thought, uh, racked our brains, not here, you know, on the show, but on our own, we could come up with other examples of bands that sort of were worked in the same within the same dynamic where it wasn't necessarily all democratic, uh, you know, democratic within the group. Uh, my other favorite band after the Beatles is Pink Floyd, and we could have a huge discussion on, on the, uh, you know, the uh, the politics that went on within that group band that at one time or another had like three different leaders at any given time, and at times there was a band that they were Pink Floyd, but there were times where it was Roger Waters and group. Um, you know, so and you have Buddy Holly and the Crickets, and you have you know various things like that. The Crickets are a band, we're a band. Um, I think they actually still sort of are a band. Um, but yeah, okay. Cliff Richards and the Shadows, Shadows were a band. Yeah. Well, I know that for for so many years, I have defended Wings as a real band, and everybody has their own definition of what a band is. And to me, the most important thing in a band is collaboration. And you could have a band that has a clear, obvious leader, as does Wings, and still have a lot of collaboration. And even going back to the very beginning, the Wings tours had songs from Denny Lane. Yeah. You know, I Would Only Smile, or Henry would get his instrumental song in there. It wasn't always Paul. I think Paul's intention from the very beginning was to establish Wings as a band to the degree where very often there'd be an interview with the band and he made sure that every member got a question. I mean, that was deliberate, that was intentional. It wasn't just Paul, it wasn't just Paul and Linda. And as the band got more and more popular in that mid seventies period, you had more stuff from Denny Lane, Jimmy McCulloch got a couple of songs in there. Um, and even during the Wings Over America tour, Denny Lane got five songs to sing lead to, and Jimmy got the one song with Medicine Jar in there. Um, so it wasn't all Paul. But the thing that sticks out in my memory more than anything else was that having grown up in the 70s, listening to the radio in New York, and at the time WPLJ was 
a big radio station for me. They had their own rock format, which is quite different from what rock stations are today. But um, they played everything from Wings. They didn't just play Paul songs. You know, when Wings of the Speed of Sound came out, you heard Time to Hide on the radio. You heard Wino Junko on the radio. You heard from Venus and Mars, you heard Medicine Jar a lot. Spirits of Ancient Egypt, which Denny sang lead to, even though Paul wrote it. You know, it wasn't just Paul's band. I even heard Cook of the House on the radio on mm -hmm. WPO. I just about every song from Speed of Sound was played on the radio. I am so glad you pointed that out, Ken, huh? because I have, that was around the time that I ventured over to FM radio. Mm -hmm. A girl I had a crush on in grammar school mentioned that she listened to WPLJ and I had to go home and find what this PLJ was. Uh, and Wings to the Speed of Sound came out in March 76, right after that time for me. And I remember not being too certain, too sure what was the single, what was the hit because PLJ was playing, she's a she's my baby and 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 beware my love as much as let him in and and silly love songs. Right, great memories. Thank you. Uh, anyway, yeah, continue. But that's my point. They went deep into wings on that radio station, and you're talking about the number one market in the country. And if PLJ did that, a lot of other rock stations in the country did the same thing. So part of the reason for Wings' appeal wasn't just that it was Paul McCartney's band. Yes, everybody knew he was the leader, but those other songs got airplay too. And in fact, I do very distinctly remember, and my wife who went to see Wings Over America always reminds me that when Wings played Time to Hide, that was a very big highlight of the show. The crowd was really into that song. So, um, where Wings fails to be recognized as a band sometimes, and I think Paul is really to blame for it, is that all of the singles were Paul's. So all the hit records that we heard in the 70s had Paul on lead vocals, all of them. And so there are people who just tend to look at Wings as though it was a backup band for Paul. And, you know, I feel very privileged as I think all three of us do, that we've interviewed various members of Wings. So we've gotten perspectives from the different members. I've interviewed Denny Sywell, we have here. I interviewed Henry, I've interviewed Denny Lane, Lawrence Juber, Steve Holly. Um, certainly Denny Sywell and Lawrence Juber would, would want us all to think that Paul wanted Wings to be looked at as a band and he treated everyone as a band. And even though there were times when Paul had very definite ideas for his own songs if someone in the band thought of something differently than what paul had and he brought it to the table and paul liked it he went with it it wasn't just all paul's ideas but and mostly. even denny sywell what's that but mostly you know he well, let he let henry play the solo on my love that he wanted right. to play but henry had to basically beg to be allowed to do it. And, uh, you know, and Paul, when he talks about it, even sort of says that he had to, you know, half of him was saying, no, 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 just do it the way I want. And half of him was saying, yeah, let, let him try it. You know, it, 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 it took a lot for Paul to let the reins loose. And, and ultimately Henry left because he wouldn't do it a second time. And Paul always wanted him to play it the same way. Yes. Yeah. And that drove him crazy. That did. Yeah. Did you I, want to say something, Darren? I was just going to say, I mean, that was early in the game in Wings' existence. And I don't know if we have any tangible evidence about how Lawrence Juber would approach a solo or when recording a song or how much freedom he was given. Uh, by Paul, but perhaps, you know, Paul was adjusting to the fact that uh, he's in his second band now. He is Paul McCartney. Can't change that. Um, so he, whether he likes it or not, is the leader of the band, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, should he be able to tell one of the band members how to do something if he feels very strongly about it, and fast forward later into the decade, 
did Paul approach the same th way with Lawrence? Did, did Paul approach this, th an issue like this, the same way when it was Lawrence Juber as his lead guitarist? You know, lear yeah. having learned from the Henry McCullough experience. Mm -hmm. If yeah. there was a I, I suspect not, because Lawrence Juber's Lawrence Juber's solos and his playing, generally speaking, is so different and so specifically Lawrence Juber-esque, uh, for lack of a better word. You know, I mean, he was he was probably the most thoroughly trained guitarist that Paul worked with. And I think Paul respected that. And Paul respected the fact that um, he was a really good jazz player. And when he wanted something like Baby's Request, you know, I don't think he, I don't think Paul hummed that, you know, intro to Lawrence Juber. I think he let Lawrence Juber play what he was going to play. And it was perfect for that. Um, that's, that's the impression I have, but, um, but back in the Henry days, and, 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 and I think Paul, Paul recognized that he had was 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 really holding too tight it was what he wanted to do because he was writing the songs he had the ideas that's what he wanted but he he recognized that henry was a blues guitarist who wanted to be out there doing different things and um you know when he, after after henry left and they went to lagos to do band on the run when Paul got back, um, you know, before the end of the year sometime, he called Henry to come into MPL and he gave him a, you know, largest check. You know, I think, I think that was in a way recognition, you know, of, of what Henry was trying to do, um, you know, and when Henry did play the, the solo on My Love, Paul loved it, you know, um, so, you know, I, th I think for Paul, it was sort of an internal battle between being the composer and wanting it to be the way he conceived it and wanting to allow input from the other people. You know, when you, um, when they did Ram, basically all the three players, David Spinoza, uh, Hugh uh, McCracken and Denny Sywell, all said basically, Paul told us exactly what he wanted to do. I think there was one song on Ram that, uh, or during the Ram sessions where Denny came up with um, his own drum thing without any input from Paul. Can't remember what it was, just read it. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, basically they, they were clear about the fact that they were told exactly what Paul wanted and they did it. They may have been a little self-effacing there because also Hugh McCracken's style was very distinctive. And you listen to those tracks and you can hear what he's doing. Uh, you know, some of it had to have been his own. It can't have just been Paul, you know, humming every single guitar lick in these things. But anyway. Right. But I think still there were occasions when Paul let the other musicians have their way whatever ideas they brought to the table. I'm not saying it was all the time. And I'm sure there were plenty of times when Paul wanted things his way and got them his way. Mm -hmm. But um, you mentioned that guitar introduction on Baby's Request. That's a beautiful example of something that Lawrence contributed to a Wings recording. He's also talked about how he and Paul came up with the idea of using that, that solo, that very weird solo that's in To You with a harmonizer. And the two of them collaborated on that together. Um, he also said words the effect that by working with Paul it brought things out of him that he didn't know he could bring to a recording like in Spin It On you know he played a certain way that he wasn't he, he didn't know if it would turn out that way but working with Paul it did um, so this collaboration of all different kinds within the band I think about well Jimmy as a lead guitarist Think about the lead guitar work that he did on The Note You Never Wrote, which is outstanding. That had to have come from him. So there's, there's all different types of examples that if you really study the catalog, you'll find that other members of Wings made contributions. But just the mere fact that other members got to have their own songs, you know, it is a shame. You know, I kind of would have liked to have seen what might have happened had Jimmy and Joe not left 
mm-hmm. when London Town was finished, would there have been another Jimmy McCullough song? Jimmy McCulloch. It's Henry McCullough, Jimmy McCulloch. I got to keep remembering that. That's the proper way I pronounce it. Is Jimmy, is it a hard k at the end of Jimmy McCulloch? I know. I, I wrote to Paul Sally about this, and he put out a book recently on, yeah. on Jimmy, and he told me the, the correct pronunciation, which so many of us get wrong. But um, yeah, I mean, Joe English did a fantastic job vocally on Must Do Something About oh, yeah. It speed of sound that's one of my favorite tracks on the album so you know there's a case of an album where every member got a lead vocal and who knows that might have continued if those two members had stayed with wings but um i'm glad you said what you said about denny lane how he waffles (laughs) uh alan because uh, i've experienced that myself and when denny was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a member of the Moody Blues. At the time, he said that Wings was not a real band. Right. And yet, at the same time, he would talk about how encouraging Paul was to him Uh to contribute more songs. So, you know, certainly uh, from what I gather, from what Lawrence has said and what Denny Sywell has said to me, that uh, Paul really strove for Wings to be recognized as a band. and, uh, you know, just by the examples of what we're talking about here, there's a, to me, there's a huge difference between Wings and the current band of the last 20 years. You don't have any of those members writing a song on Paul's album and singing lead on them. Yeah, you know? Good point. Yep. Um, sometimes members are on his tracks on his, on his solo album. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes Paul plays all the instruments or, or most of them. With Wings... Whatever band lineup you had at the time, that's what was on the album. And that was the band that went out and toured. So I think there's a big distinction between a Wings recording and a solo recording. And um, I know that a lot of people find it difficult to make a distinction between the two because Paul has such an enormous presence with his music. You know, and I also remember this is something. You know, if we talk to Lawrence Juber again, and it's always a joy to talk to him, but he was talking about the material that Wings was rehearsing at the end of of the group there. Um, And he was saying that a lot of the material wasn't really suitable for a group lineup. It was more for a studio recording, like Take It Away, for example, or Average Person. And yet at the same time, they rehearsed No Values. (laughs) <laughs> which Paul did with a band in Give My Regards to Broad Street. So I think that, you know, I, I, he, what he was probably sensing was a lot of the material that Paul wrote during Wings, maybe Paul was envisioning going out on the road and playing live with. Not every song, obviously, but maybe what he was sensing was the material that Paul was starting to write <clears throat> after Back to the Egg not just McCartney too, but the stuff that they rehearsed was more suitable for a solo record. He was going more in that direction. So do you think that Wings deserves to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Are they a separate body of work from everything that Paul has done after the Beatles? Darren? Yes. And you feel that? Yes. Yeah, I mean, if they went... They, they, they technically existed for just about 10 years, all right? Uh, eight or nine of those years, they were one of the biggest selling acts, as I mentioned before, in music. Um, in the United States alone, again, if I remember correctly, I, I believe the Beach, Bee Gees and Elton John were the only two that outsold Wings. Um, they wings is not Paul's name. Wings is the band. We've gone through that already here. Uh, the body of work is too big and it is too successful, uh, strictly on commercial terms to dismiss it as just being, Oh, you know, it's Paul. Well, yeah, it's Paul, but it's wings. And again, I'm sure that if I had the time here, uh, I could think of other examples of bands that, were real, really a front man and his support, and they end up, you know, getting getting 
accolades as a unit. Wings were a unit, and I think they should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but I don't feel as passionate about it anymore because the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, has worn me down in, in like the last five or 10 years. You know, how people like John Mayo are not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is beyond comprehension to me. Therefore, I no longer get too keyed up about Wings and Emerson, Lincoln Palmer and, you know, um, and should Wings be in? Actually, at this point, it doesn't really matter. But to me, um, they were Paul's band. Paul was the leader. Paul was part of Wings. And, you know, they belong in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I, I mean, it's just I feel strongly about it. And, mm -hmm. and, right. I, and, 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 and you could take it to the bank. <laughs> Alan, your opinion. Um, I don't really feel strongly about it either way. Um, <clears throat> Paul is in twice already. Um, and as Darren says, John Mayall isn't in once yet. Um, maybe everyone should get in once before people get in, you know, multiple times. But, you know, I don't have a strong feeling. I, I, I would not say, wow, that's ridiculous if they did get in. And, um, you know, I can I can can totally get behind the rationale for including them as a specific um, period within Paul's output uh, that was with what was intended to be a band that toured as a band that sold a lot of records as a band. Um, there are bands in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame that I think have less business being there than Wings does. So, yeah, why not? Hmm. Okay. And my feeling, uh, you probably could figure out, uh, <laughs> is that, yes, I think Wing should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but I think it, it'll never happen because he's already in there for his post-Beatles work. And that would also mean that the Hall of Fame would have to admit <clears throat> making a mistake by ignoring the Wings part of, uh, of his catalog or just making it all one body of work Beatles and everything after Beatles. But, um, you know, there, there's another thing here that in the very beginning, when Wildlife came out, it was a Wings album. It wasn't a Paul McCartney and Wings album. It was, it was a Wings album. And it didn't chart. Well, it did go number 10, which for a lot of people is respectable. But um, for some people, that would be looked at as a disappointment. And probably the record company felt that way, too. And then... Red Rose Speedway came out as Paul McCartney and Wings, you know, and then Ben on the Run came out as Paul McCartney and Wings. And once Paul really had, he was at the peak there, building himself up where he's having hit records galore. They're all doing very well. Ben on the Run is his most successful album. After that, he didn't want to rely on Paul McCartney and, and the name Paul McCartney. He went back to calling it Wings for Venus and Mars and Speed of Sound and Wings Over America and London Town and Back to the Egg. You know, that was his goal for it to be looked at as Wings. So I think all along his intention was for the world to look at it as a band, whether or not you think it was successful, whether or not because of the personnel changes that gets in the way, I really don't think it should because there are, as we've said, a lot of bands that have had multiple changes in their lineup that still get in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But I really do think overall that because of all the success that uh, that Paul had with Wings, I mean, it was um, see Red Rose Speedway, Ben on the Run, Venus and Mars, Speed of Sound, and Wings Over America. That's five albums in a row that all went to number one in the United States. That's really impressive right there. Not to mention all the hits the follow-up albums, London Town and Back to the Egg being top 10 albums. It's a lot of success there being sold as Wings. And so I do believe there should be a distinction there, but I'm not holding my breath. And it is true, there are other artists who are around before Wings that deserve to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame that are not. So, you know, I'm not worried about this, but I really do think that it's a shame that Wings is not recognized as its own separate entity from everything else. 15 years ago, I would have been much more vocal and more passionate about it. But the way 
who goes in, when they go in, who uh, who's eligible, who isn't. It's clouded it so it, it it's so it's clouded the whole process so much that um, it doesn't really mean as much to me anymore. Mm. So, you know, why should wings be in if Paul's covered already? Right. And then you've got all these other acts that aren't even in there. Like Alan pointed out, they, they're not even in there once. There are artists from the fifties and sixties that are still not in. I mean, I was complaining about the Moody Blues until a few years ago. I kept <laughs> not be in. And, you know, now I'm saying Peter, Paul, and Mary. Good point. They're well, never recognized. Hey, and all the other folk greats are, you know, Dylan and Joan Baez. And, but where's Peter, Paul, and Mary? So, right. And, and now that the door is opened, and I don't want to turn this into a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame debate, now the controversial uh, topic in recent years is the fact that the door has been opened to rap artists. Hmm. Okay. Well, in one regard... Uh, I really believe that rap is sort of a modern day folk music and that the Peter, Paul and Mary's uh, can be put alongside NWA and you could, you know, you, you could draw comparisons behind uh, the material that they did. What was the message that they were delivering? What was the, um, the impetus to what, you know, they were all about? very similar, completely different musically, completely different eras. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to let NWA in, then you got to let Peter, Paul and Mary in. And once you've let NWA in, who's to say that, that, uh, um, why, why am I drawing a blank on, uh, uh, I run DMC. That's not who I'm trying to think of though. Now they all need to get in now. Hmm. And and it's just opened up this whole thing where rename the museum the Music Hall of Fame. Hmm. The rock fans are very divided on this. There are some that feel the rap artists shouldn't get in, disco artists shouldn't get in. You know. Anyway, you know, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> that could be a whole other show. So we have some lists here to present to our listeners and viewers of our favorite studio album, Some Wings, and our top 10 songs from Wings. So why don't we start, first of all, with you, Darren, for the studio albums. List them from seven to one. Okay. Um, seven studio albums. So we're excluding the live album, Wings Over America, and naturally the compilation, Wings Greatest. Mm -hmm. Um so you want to go backwards. So seven to one, I had most trouble in doing this list, trying to figure out which is six and which is seven. <laughs> and, I, and, and I settled in on what I'm about to say. But I want to say the caveat here is that I love both these albums. Something has to drop to the bottom. Um, so at the bottom of my list at number seven is Back to the Egg. Um, I didn't think it was the strongest batch of songs that Paul cooked up. You know, um, things like uh, um, We're Open Tonight to You, um, lesser songs, cool songs, but, you know, I tried to weigh them when all came down. How many songs did I feel were very strong and how many resembled filler? And as I did that, Back to the Egg slowly dropped towards the bottom. Um, which is kind of unusual because I do like McCartney, the edgier McCartney, and that's what Back to the Egg was, the heaviest Wings album. Or, mm, I, I don't know, arguably McCartney's heaviest, but you do have Run, Devil, Run, and, you know. So, hmm. But at the bottom of my list is Back to the Egg, and uh, up at number six is London Town. Um, again, it's simply a case of something has to drop towards the bottom, Although London Town might have been stronger if a couple of songs were dropped from it. Uh, name and Address, Famous Groupies, perhaps. Uh, I was never really nuts about uh, I've Had Enough. I felt the song 
had so much more potential as being a harder rocker than it was. Hmm. And it just didn't really, you know, Paul didn't crank it to 11 like he could have on that song. Uh, so I have London Town at six. Uh, at number five, Wildlife. Uh, to me, Wildlife was a very strong collection of songs. All right, Bip Bop and Mumbo. But I mean, where when Paul was clicking, Tomorrow I Am Your Singer, some people never know. Even I even like uh, Wildlife and Dear Friend. Strong songs, um, perhaps not the best recorded album, perhaps too many uh, rough spots were left in there. And also, I don't think a lot of people knew who Wings were. Thus, the sales were affected and the decision to not release any singles. I don't know how any of that worked. That's the kind of thing, Alan, I'm looking forward to reading in your book. Hopefully it's in there. Why McCartney and Wildlife didn't have any singles from it, from them. Um, so my number five was uh, Wildlife. Number four, Venus and Mars. Um, I just, I'm just going to name them because there's really... Uh, why Venus and Mars is uh, four and Wings the Speed of Sound three. Just how I feel about those albums. Um, I thought Wings at the Speed of Sound actually is close to a flawless album. Hmm. Um, and then the two that are near and dear to my heart at the top, number two, Red Rose Speedway. Uh, to me, is the sleeper in Mac McCartney's entire catalog. Uh, to me, some of the some of the most Beatlish, some of the strongest material he cooked up was on Red Rose Speedway and it just in time I think falls through the cracks amongst this huge body of work and at the top of the list is Band on the Run um, uh, so Band on the Run 1, Red Rose Speedway 2 Wings to the Speed of Sound 3 Venus and Mars 4 and I'm if we did this in a year I might flip flop those two, 3 and 4 Mm -hmm. Wildlife Five, uh, London Town Six, back to the Egg Seven. Okay, it's interesting. You know, through the years, our opinions could change about these albums. And just out of curiosity, I just thought of this question: Do you, do these archival releases that have come out have they changed your opinion of these albums in any way? Have you thought more highly of one? Uh, in particular, like I know a lot of people have said, wow, I really appreciate Red Rose Speedway now. If I think about it as a double album. Actually, mm -hmm. um, really, truly, it was, you know, you have to think of it in, in these terms for the album as it came out. Yes, I think there were a couple of those songs that maybe could be defined as filler and could have been left to the side. But I think Red Rose Speedway is stronger with all of the songs that were eliminated. Mm -hmm. uh, and I... <laughs> often find myself listening to those tracks alone from the archive. Uh, those, those, those songs that were left off Red Rose Speedway. It almost played like a, when I say like the White Album, in that it was all over the map. There was no pinning the White Album down. The Beatles were all over the place. Hmm. A ballad, here's, here's something off the wall like Wild Honey Pie. Here's a blue song and here's something you can ba barely hear like long, 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 and then there's Revolution Nine and uh, and 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 Blackbird all over the place, uh, and I think Red Rose Speedway could have been McCartney's slash Wings's White Album, Wings's, <laughs> Wings's plural is it Wings? Anyway, it's Wings. So that's the one album where I think the uh, the the reissue, the deluxe reissue, really. Uh, turned me on even more to an album that I loved already. That was also my first Wings album, my first McCartney album. I believe so. The first McCartney album I owned was a cassette of Red Road Speedway, if I remember correctly, and Band on the Run right after that. Two cassettes, anyway. So, okay. those are my albums. Interesting countdown there, Darren. Alan, your turn. Okay. Um, at the risk of, um, you know, people who are upset by beeps, I got to turn my space heater back on. It's going to beep. <laughs> Hear that? <laughs> okay. <Nice beep. clears throat> yeah. Um, 
Okay, there, there, it's it's funny because there are certain things where Darren and I have the same number for the same album and certain things that are like totally opposite. So um, for seven, I have wildlife. Um, <clears throat> I actually, um, in working on the book, particularly uh, even more than the um, deluxe edition, I've come to appreciate more about wildlife than I did. Um, I, it's, it's actually sort of, you know, side one and side two are very different. Um, and a lot of the stuff on side two, I think is, is, is actually quite good. And the stuff on side one, I think he was going for feel, you know, more than precision. Um, on side two, I think they're going more for precision and a lot of, a lot of it, um, um, it's a it's 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 a better album, I think, than I used to think it was. Um, but uh, I understand why people have problems with it, and I think that of of the seven, it has something has to drop down to the bottom, as Darren said, and that's the one for me. Um, six is London Town. A lot of good stuff on it. Um, there's there's one track on it, at least, that is in my uh, top 10 of wing songs. Uh, the other list that we're doing. Um, there, there really are a lot of things, nice things on it. But um, in terms, I'm thinking in terms of like what I'm likely to put on and play uh, and in what order that would be. And London Town and Speed of Sound as five. Those two um, I don't know. There's, there's something about them that to me don't measure up to the ones towards the top of my list, but, you know, again, there's, there's a lot on speed of sound. I like too. um, Venus and Mars. I have as four. Um, the funny thing is that I think of Venus and Mars as like, Band on the Run Part Two, in the same way I think of Pipes of Peace as Tug of War Part Two. I mean, I I think of those four albums as two pairs of albums, um, and I'm not sure really why, but uh, apart from that, they were consecutive. Um, but so that's four. Uh, when I when I listen to it critically, they're you know, maybe it should actually be lower than speed of sound in London town now that I think of it. But, um, I, you know, it has an energy that I kind of like. And, um, you know, it, to a certain degree, propelled a lot of Wings Over America, you know, I mean, the opening of it, for instance, of, of Wings Over America. And, 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 um, so I, I think that there's, you know, and also things like letting go. I really like letting go. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that's four. Three is Red Rose Speedway. If it was the double album, it might be one. Um, when they were doing it as a double album um, and all of them were really excited about it as a double album because it showed the band as a band. That was what, they wanted to do it's what paul wanted to do um it had you know seaside woman on it it had you know it had uh some of denny's things and basically when it got cut down to a single album it became more of a paul album that was something denny uh, not denny but um henry complained about and i think denny was not happy about it either none of them were um, they felt forced into it by, I think, EMI and Paul's manager at the time. Um, but that's what happened to it. But when I listen to the double now, you know, thanks to the deluxe set, or you could even reconstruct it, you know, some of the stuff is, is uh, uh, Ram session stuff. Um, which is actually kind of funny because they're thinking of it as a band album. They're thinking of it as an album that, that more than wildlife is going to show what they can do as a band, what breadth they have as a band stylistically. <laughs> and yet some of the stuff is really Ram stuff pre-band, although, you know, Danny Sywell's in it and they did some work on it, overdubbing some new parts that got Denny on there um, and Henry. But um 
anyway, so that would be three. Two would be back to the egg. Um, I rate it a lot more highly than Darren does, um, partly because, um, you know, I, I like Lawrence Juber's playing a lot. Um, that to me enlivens, you know, the whole thing. And, and, and I think Steve Holly is a pretty good drummer and uh, the band clicks. Um, also, you know, I think of Back to the Egg as, as one of the sort of great underappreciated McCartney slash Wings albums. Um, and maybe one of the reasons that I like it so much is that, uh, you know, I think the, the video album version of it works really well. Um, Ooh. yeah, I just, I like a lot of those videos and I think that they represent the songs really well. I think the, the, the songs have a great deal of variety, um, baby's request arrow through me, spin it on. I mean, um, there's just a lot of really good stuff in there. Um, on a different day, that might be number one, but number one, you know, really, if you're going to be realistic, sort of has to be bad on the run. Um, that was recorded under, you know, great adversity. I mean, you know, two guys leaving the band within two weeks of, the start of the sessions, one of them the night before they left for Lagos uh, or the night they left for Lagos actually. Um, and Paul deciding to do it anyway, uh, doing the drums himself. Uh, and there's, you know, also in a studio that was, you know, his whole idea of, you know, let's go someplace exotic and, you know, and uh, get away from the familiar old thing at EMI. I think he came to realize the value of the familiar old thing at EMI because in, at EMI in London, not to mention the other London studios that he was used to using, um, the stuff worked, <laughs> you know, um, and, you know, they, they got there, there were no vocal booths. <laughs> there was, and in fact, the, the equipment wasn't even, wasn't even set up to multi-track properly because that just wasn't done in Lagos. You know, what they were recording in Lagos was, was basically groups that came in and recorded live in the studio. You didn't need to know how to multi-track, you know? Um, and if the equipment couldn't handle it, uh, usually because there was something wrong with the equipment, it should have been able to handle it. Um, that wasn't an issue for them, but it was an issue for Paul and for Jeff Emmerich, who was engineering it. Um, so, yeah, and that had, you know, there's, there's a million other things that went wrong in Lagos. Uh, and yet they came up with some really interesting experimental stuff, you know, Drink to Me, which started out as just, you know, Paul on an acoustic guitar, you know, responding to Dustin Hoffman's requests to, you know, can you just write something, you know, um, just like that. Can you, can you write it about this topic, you know? Um, that became quite an involved production. And, um, you know, some of that was done back in London. Um, but it was started in Lagos, uh, 1985, you know, incredible song. It sounds, you know, you listen to it, you listen to it with one ear and it just sounds, you know, like a riffy little piano thing. You listen to it with both ears. There's a whole lot of stuff going on in that. Um, mm. and, and that's the case for a lot of these things. Uh, you know, Denny's, uh, Denny slash Paul's no words, um, you know, there's some great stuff in that. Bluebird, one of Paul's, you know, most beautiful acoustic pieces. Um, that's just an album without uh, any low spots, really. And uh, so that that really has to be number one. So I guess I'm at the end of my list. Ken? Okay. <laughs> well, your list sort of scares me, Alan, because we, we have a lot in common there. Um, <laughs> I'm going to start with my number seven album, which is Wildlife. And um, kind of like I've said many times here on this show, every single, not just Paul album, every solo album has some worthwhile material. Even the weakest albums, what you consider to be the weakest, have certain songs that 
are essential, I feel, in the catalog of each of the solo Beatles. And it certainly is the case in Wildlife because, uh, you know, to put together any kind of compilation on Paul without Tomorrow in it, I mean, that is, to me, one of my favorite of all of his post Beatle songs. I, it's just, I don't know why that song wasn't a single. Um, really deserved to be one. I loved his voice on it. I love the false ending and when he screams at the end. Uh, some people never know is a real gem. I have always loved the cover of Love is Strange. So just for those three tracks alone, I just think it's, it's a, you know, a good album. It's just, you know, like we said, there's always got to be those albums that are at the bottom. And, um, and I do like the rawness of the album production wise. I think it seems to matter a lot to people these days to have less production, less polish. And that also explains why a lot of the um, very early McCartney stuff uh, seems to do very well in people's opinions these days. Um, like the first McCartney album and Wildlife and Red Rose Speedway um, and Ram, which still had much more production behind it. But still, um, part of the appeal for a lot of for a lot of fans is the simplicity and the rawness of an album like Wildlife. And really and truly, um, I do like every song on Wildlife. I don't recognize Bip Bop as a great song in any way, but you know there is a certain charm to a song like that and you know for anyone that does love it i don't make fun of their taste you know um london town is my number six album a lot of great songs on there i love cafe on the left bank it's one of my favorite uh wing songs i like jimmy's lead guitar work in that song um i think with a little luck is one of the greatest of all of the wing singles i think it's a masterpiece of pop and especially that instrumental section in the middle, I've been saying for decades, is absolutely brilliant. The whole build up up until the last verse. Um, I love Don't Let It Bring You Down a lot as an acoustic song. I love uh, Delivery of Children, his collaboration with Denny Lane. And I love the weirdness of Morris Moose and the Grey Goose. Yeah. I do agree with you, Darren, about I've had enough to kind of lack something. It's a good rocker. It needs more balls to it. I don't know what it is. Yeah. There's something about that recording of it. When they did it live in 79, I think it had more life to it. Um, but London Town has a lot of great moments, but overall, and I love the title track too, as a matter of fact. Um, overall, you know, it still has to be closer to the bottom. Um, number five, I put speed of sound one of the reasons why i love that album so much is for the very reason that we talked about here that every single member gets a lead vocal i like the fact that it showcases the vocals of all the members and as i said before um joe english what a surprise what great vocals on must do something about it and uh time to hide is a definite highlight of uh of that album and the tour as i said earlier beware my love wow can remember that getting loads of airplay. Like I said, with all the tracks from Speed of Sound, it's a great rocker. Wish Paul would bring that back live. I love um, Silly Love Songs, one of his best singles. Mm. A lot of intricacies in that recording there, of all the counter melodies going on simultaneously and all the work that was done on the harmonies on that song. Warm and Beautiful is a great ballad. Um, you know, I really like every single song on Speed and Sound. It's just that I like the other albums that I place higher more. Number four, I put Back to the Egg. I love the hard edge of many of the songs on Back to the Egg. It was a welcome change from London Town, which was a much softer album. Um, I like the new additions of having Lawrence Juber and Steve Holly in the band. I especially love Spit It On and <clears throat> the real um gutsy vocals edgy vocals of paul on old siamser and i actually love to you which is very punkish and very weird and wacky and i love that side of paul when he does display it um sometimes as much as i like them the medleys kind of drag things down <clears throat> on side two of back to the egg i still enjoy them a lot i do love arrow through me i think that's a brilliant song um, and as, as Lauren said to us, when we did the talk more talk interview with him, no bass guitar on that, 
that was all from a Fender Rhodes. You know, you would think it has this big fat bass sound, but it's really interesting what he did there on that song. And it's very tough to sing Arrow Through Me if you're a vocalist, because the vocals jump all over the place. Kind of like a Burt Bacharach song <laughs> in a way. But um, I love Back to the Egg. I think it's a solid album all the way through. Um, but the only problem sometimes I have with Back to the Egg is that if I was to say, pick what is the obvious single. <clears throat> well, Getting Closer only went to number 20 on the charts. And Arrow Through Me, as much as I love it, only went to 29. There's never been a song on there where, where I would say, that is the definite single. Yeah. And maybe, maybe Lawrence is right that Goodnight Tonight should have been on the album. It kind of sticks out like a sore thumb stylistically with everything else. But then Paul is so varied in his music, you know, it doesn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me if a song like that was on the album. And, um, you know, that was a number five hit in the country. But <clears throat> I think Back to the Egg, as it was released, lacked an obvious <clears throat> single for the album but um still it's right there in the middle of all the wings albums and number four number three i put red rose speedway red rose speedway is one of the rare examples of an album that i've always liked and like so much more now and it has nothing to do <clears throat> with the box set that came out and the double album treatment i love just those songs that were on that album and you know I think we talked about this, Alan, but I've interviewed Denny Sywell a few times now, and we have, and Denny did say that the band picked the material for that album <clears throat> and the sequencing of the songs. Mm -hmm. Losing my voice here, sorry. <clears throat> but um, no, I love the songs as they appear in that sequencing. And to me, Little Lamb Dragonfly is one of the greatest songs of his career. Um, it's one of those songs where and we've said this before about a number of McCartney songs where it, it's like several separate pieces of work that are joined together. And in this case, you would never know that they were separate songs because they flow together so well. The melody is so absolutely gorgeous. The whole arrangement and what's played on the, on the guitars before the, the la 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 part of the song, um, it's, it's a stunning piece of work. And I think that um, I, I couldn't see it as a single, but it's one that should always be looked at as being one of the greatest songs of Paul's entire career. Um, just absolutely stunningly beautiful melodically. His voice is wonderful. The harmony is great. I know Denny Sywell has said that he worked on the harmony arrangement of it. Um, and yes, it originated from Ram, but um, just to have Little Lamb Dragonfly on any album, boosts it way up for me. Um, My Love was a great ballad as a single. I love Get On The Right Thing, which also originated from Ram. Really everything on the album and the, the, um, the medley on side two is absolutely brilliant. The mere fact that you can take those four songs and then at the very end of the album, they're all played flowing into each other or it just works so well is, is genius to me. When the Night is another overlooked song because it has an odd time signature to it. And it's a great, great melody, a great hook. Um, very unusual. And I do love Loop. I love the experimental songs of Paul more now than I ever have. I wish he would do more of that stuff. Um, the only song I've ever had a problem with is Single Paging. And I know there are a lot of people that love that song. You know, it's harmless. I like it. It's a nice melody. But everything else on Red Rose Speedway, I just adore. I think that it's um, One More Kiss is a simple song, but it really, it's a complete song. It works together really well. A lot of these acoustic songs that Paul does could have fit on the White Album, you know, a la Blackbird, Mother Nature's Son. You know, there's a lot of songs, and especially those first few years, of his solo career in Wings that would fit that kind of mold. You know, One More Kiss is another song like that to me, as is Little Lamb Dragonfly. Um, I think much more highly these days of Red River Speedway as the album it was released in 73. Always liked it, now really love it. 
Number two is Venus and Mars, which I think has become a very underrated album now in Paul's solo career. And I think it also suffers the fate of being the follow-up album to Ben on the Run. Um, but I really like everything that's on Venus and Mars, and it's a brilliant opening Venus and Mars rock show, tailor-made as was the purpose for touring with it. It's one of my greatest, you know, openings of any rock album is that medley, and it works so well to use on a tour. It's a great rock song. I love everything about it. Again, this idea that Paul comes up with so many melodies and so many, you know, sections of songs strung together and listen to rock show. You've got a lot of different sections there that all work well together. The single was abysmal for that, the way it was edited, but the full version I absolutely love. So many great songs on Venus and Mars. Treat Her Gently, Lonely Old People is one of my favorite album closers. Although Crossroads theme really was the closer. But as far as the full song is concerned, listen to what the man said is perfect pop. One of the greatest pop singles of Paul's solo career. <clears throat> Call Me Back Again has a great R&B edge to it. Um, I love Magneto and Titania Man. Um, just the fact that, you know, Paul wrote a song about you know, cartoon characters like that. And um, and Letting Go is a great song too, although I do love it live better than on the studio version, but still, I love the studio version as well. Really, everything on this album, I love how he brings back Venus and Mars for side two, going into Spirits of Ancient Egypt. I thought that's brilliant. Um, love and Song is a nice ballad. Everything about Venus and Mars works for me. So I really think it's a truly great album and uh, one that needs to be reappraised. Um, and number one is still Ben on the Run. Ben on the Run is one of those albums that sometimes I equate with um, <clears throat> Sgt. Pepper in a way because Sgt. Pepper is almost always through the years been looked at as the Beatles' greatest album. Not everybody feels that way today. I think a lot of people have growing a bit tired of it, you know. Um, but Band on the Run is kind of the same thing. There are times when I've grown tired of Band on the Run, but I can't deny the fact that all the songs on it are truly great. And I also am very much a fan of the American version with Helen Wheels in it. Yep. It makes a, a very big difference. Helen Wheels is one of my favorite rockers in Paul's career, but every single song on Band on the Run is fantastic. And I'm glad you brought up Picasso's last words because, uh, Alan, because of um, how he mixes in Jet and uh, Mrs. Vanderbilt <laughs> into the song, which I thought was brilliant. 1985 is one of the greatest songs of Paul's career, period. The way that song works with what he's playing on the piano and what he's singing, it all flows together so well, you know, um, there's just something about the instincts that Paul has with his music, what he's playing, how everything works together in his arrangements. 1985 is, it's beyond brilliant. And how it comes back with um, Band on the Run at the very end. Um, you know, every song here works. I love Let Me Roll It, though I wish Paul would give it a rest in concert. Uh, <laughs> I love Mamunia a lot because I hardly ever hear it you know, being played on the radio. So I like hearing songs that you don't hear as much. I love No Words a lot. I think that was a great collaboration between Paul and Denny Lane there. Jet is a great rocker. It's definitely a classic. Never get tired of hearing Jet. Um, Bluebird is great. You know, song for song, Mrs. Vanderbilt. You know, they all work. Every single song on that album is solid. And I could understand why a lot of people rate it as their number one album of, of uh, the Wings era. So I don't know what more I can say about it. It truly deserves to be number one. But there is, you know, in my case, there is some fatigue factor on that particular album. I wish other albums that aren't given as much credit would be and would be examined more. So that's my list. All right. You realize that... Um... <clears throat> Alan and Ken of the seven albums, you have five of them in the same position. The two of you, only two albums uh, are in different positions. The other five you have 
in the same slots. I guess that shows how much I'm influencing Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. <laughs> and that is a scary thought, too. Anyway, so why don't we do uh, our top 10 songs from the Wings period? This time, we'll start with Alan. Okay. <clears throat> Mine are um, largely in chronological order because I don't really, you know, it's really too hard to rate favorites, you know, from a body of work like this, and you've got only 10. Um, <clears throat> so I'll start with their first single, which is um, Give Ireland Back to the Irish. Henry was in the band for a matter of days when they recorded that. And, you know, his playing on that is, uh, you know, really sort of shows what's to come. But also the thing is that Give Ireland Back to the Irish is, you know, so uncharacteristic of Paul in a way, you know, I mean, until, until Egypt Station, you didn't really hear a political opinion from him, but, um, you know, he watched uh, Bloody Sunday unfold on TV, you know, on news reports and, and was very upset by it and decided to, to say something about it. Um, and it got banned. It was a lot of trouble for him. Um, you know, EMI tried to persuade him not to release it. Uh, and then when he sort of insisted that he wanted it released, they were okay, but um, you know, the BBC banned it, um, the ind independent British stations banned it. <coughs> and um, <clears throat> it was also you know, misunderstood by a lot of people. I mean, it, uh, people in, in England, um, some, of, some people took it as like a pro IRA song, which is not what it is. And, uh, um, it, it really did cause them a lot of problems. So that's all detailed in the book. So I'll leave it to that. Um, second, um, second one is, I guess, their third single, High, 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 also banned. <laughs> um, I think I like the band Paul uh, single. <laughs> Um, you know, high, high, high is, uh, you know, they wrote as a rocker, they were going to be going on tour, you know, to Europe and, um, you know, specifically wanted something like that. Um, but, you know, it's got a lot of, a lot of funny stuff in it, you know, the polygon business, um, you know, he's, I believe him. I believe him when he says that it was Polygon. He's got a whole story about, you know, where he found it and why he used it. And um, and he's even said, you know, the, the BBC said it was body gun. And actually, that's probably a better line, <laughs> you know. Um, but, you know, I like the energy of it. Uh, the third is Tomorrow. Um, as Ken says, you can't have a compilation of McCartney's best stuff without tomorrow in there. And, you know, this is right off of Wildlife, which is, you know, supposedly the worst Wings album. If you figure that some that whatever's down at number seven, you know, fits that description, although I wouldn't put it that way. Um, <clears throat> beautiful song, just beautiful song. Um, let's see. Ah. Little Lamb Dragonfly, uh, that in backseat of my car uh, are, are the my favorites from the Ram sessions. Um, but I couldn't include backseat of my car because it's not technically a Wings release. But um, Little Lamb Dragonfly was, and it and it legitimately is because um, it wasn't finished at the Ram sessions. Um, lyrics weren't finished. Um, Denny held. Uh, helped with that both Denny's I think helped with that um and uh you know it's just a beautiful song I mean one of the reasons I think he may not have inc included it on Ram or, or worked to finish it on Ram is because it was really sort of set aside for his Rupert project um but you know once he once he decided to embrace it as a, a, a wings thing um it's it's just a great song. Fifth is Picasso's Last Words, which you know, we've talked about. Um, <clears throat> sixth is Letting Go. I know what you mean about the live one being a bit um, 
you know, more out there and more of what it should be. But I, I like the album track uh, as well. And I might as well skip to number eight because I could say the same thing about I've had enough. I know, I, I know both of you feel the same way about it um, and I understand why you do, but I like it as a song. And to me, it, it always has had a certain electricity that, um, you know, that does it for me. So I guess I'm the odd guy out there in between those two letting go. And I've had enough is, you know, something completely different, warm and beautiful. Um, okay. You know, again, another, you know, McCartney could write a melody. I know that this is a, you know, a, an avant-garde concept no one has ever mentioned before, but the guy really has uh, an incredible way of making a melody and uh and warm and beautiful has like like tomorrow you know it has uh it has that going for it uh number nine uh in the same series as i've had enough and letting go is spin it on <laughs> i just like hmm. this rocky stuff you know if you look at this list there's high 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 letting go i've had enough spin it on but number 10 is Baby's Request for reasons that we've all mentioned. Um, so, you know, if you if I were to make this list tomorrow or next week, it might be 10 completely different songs. Um, but this is what it is today. Mm. Good list. I wanted to question you on one thing because you said that not until like Egypt Station was Paul really putting up political songs, but I immediately thought of Freedom. Oh, and, right. Um, okay. Big boys bickering. So there are That's those true. moments. That's true. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Not very frequently, but he does do it once in a rare moment. <laughs> <laughs> Darren? I'm keeping, by the way, I'm keeping score. I'm keeping track of everyone's. Okay. Your top 10. My top 10. Are we doing, what do we want to do? Um, I sort of ranked mine, but... <laughs> There's no real rhyme or reason to the order I put them in other than as I was making the list, uh, my very, very favorite songs uh, were popping out of my head first. So that's kind of the order that as they popped out of my head, they went on the list. Okay. Number one, this is going to shock everyone. Little Lamb Dragonfly. <laughs> <laughs> that's number one. It has been my favorite McCartney song slash favorite wing, wing song for eons now going all the way back to the days before we had the wheel not the wheel it's a joke it's about <laughs> before we invented the wheel huh? so there's little lamb dragonfly number one number two no words mm. from band on the run interesting number three junior's farm my favorite mccartney rocker mm -hmm. okay and then um Number four, Helen Wheels. Helen Wheels and Junior's Farm, you know, they were released, you know, within a year, give or take, of each other. And I just kind of always thought of those songs together. They were, you know, up-tempo rockers from, from Wings. Uh, number five, Time to Hide. Denny's Shining Moment in Wings. Time to Hide is number five. You might be confused with Deliver Your Children, which Denny and Paul wrote Probably. Together. And again, like I pointed out, did I point it out during? No, I pointed out before we started recording. My memory is going away. <laughs> All right, so that's time to hide is five. Six, London Town. That's a gem. Ooh, Simple okay. as that. That's a gem on that album. And number seven, uh, the four song album closing medley on Red Rose Speedway. Um, uh, Hold Me Tight, Lazy Dynamite, Hands of Love, Power Cut. And what really sends that over the top is that 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 coda that end of the song where then Paul takes these four nice songs taken individually and weaves them into this 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 Abbey Roadish type medley at the end the true medley it's outstanding in the guitar the guitar parts I've always kind of wondered who's playing what you know, at the end of that four song medley, what's Denny playing? What's Henry playing? Is Paul playing anything in there? Um, uh, that's just 
that's just gives me chills still to this day. Um, so that's the medley, uh, the four song medley at the end of Red Rose Speedway seven. My number eight pick is Country Dreamer. Mm. Just because I wanted to go with something left of center, something that was a non-album track. Um, at number nine, Mull of Kintyre. Yes. Uh, would be, I think, considered today one of McCartney's uh, great accomplishments if it were a big hit in the U.S. like it was everywhere else. That's the only thing I think that keeps Mull of Kintyre off people's radar, especially here mm. on our side of the pond. Uh, and um, then closing out my list at number 10, I Would Only Smile. Wow. Denny Lane's song is beautiful. And why that didn't make the cut on Red Rose Speedway, why that one ended up being the one that got dropped, mm -hmm. never made any sense to me. Denny's released it. It was on Japanese Tears, his second solo album. Um, I think Denny, the version that was on Japanese Tears is the Wings version, if I'm not mistaken. I get confused because then years later, it seemed to pop up here and there on other Denny Lane albums and compilations. And in some instances seem to be somewhat re-recorded or maybe using the backing track. And, but, um, and I would only smile. I, I, I loved it the first time I heard it on a bootleg. Uh, one of the first, if not the first bootlegs I ever got of McCartney's in the early 80s and um, hearing it on the Red Rose Speedway box set then, um, you know, and on Japanese Tears years ago. I don't think I don't think I. Japanese Tears is an album I don't really remember having. I don't remember my reaction to it at first. But hearing hearing I would only smile on the Red Rose Speedway box set was like that. Aha. Yeah. Why isn't that on Red Rose Speedway? So Little Lamb Dragonfly, No Words, Junior's Farm, Helen Wheels, Time to Hide, London Town, uh, Medley, Hold Me Tight, Lazy Dynamite, Hands of Love, Power Cut, Country Dreamer, Mull of Kintyre, I Would Only Smile. So remind me, was this, were you going in order of your favorite? The number one, or just these are your top well, ten? I would roughly, roughly my face. Um, number one was what again? A little Lamb Dragonfly was number one, has been number one. That's a no-brainer. No words, second. Uh, and then after that, if I made this list again next week, you know, I think from three on down, it's possible things would shuffle around. I, I didn't want to exclude a certain era. So maybe including... Mull of Kintyre or London Town might have been the result of not having later 70s stuff on the list. Hmm. Uh, I don't know, but uh, that that's where I'm at right now. Ken, your turn. All right. Thanks, Darren. As always, a great list right there. Um, I did uh, put together my top 10 in order. Um, it's always easy for me to, to name like my number one or number two song, but then once you, once you start going from three to 10, you really got to think about these things. And like we've said, check with us in a year from now or a week from now. Well, maybe not a week from now, but a year from now, it could be very different. But um, my number 10 song is my favorite B-side from this time period. And that's Sally G. Hmm. Sally G is a great country rock song from Paul and Wings and everything about it is perfect. The melody is great. Paul's vocals are, are fantastic. The steel pedal guitar from Lloyd Green helps to make the song. And even the lyrics are a little humorous. You know, you, you took the part that was the heart of me, Sally G. I never knew what the letter G stood for, but I knew for sure it wasn't good. You know, stuff like that. I loved it. It's, um, it's just a great song. It just shows how absolutely versatile Paul McCartney is at mastering almost any genre of music. And Sally G is just that for me. Um, number nine, I put in Medicine Jar because I really think it's a great rocker. It's one that I'm always in the mood to listen to. Um, it's a great recording on Venus and Mars. It's a great live recording. Having seen Wings in 76, though, you know, it's a long time ago now, but I do remember loving hearing that song live, just like I loved hearing 
you know, everything else and time to hide, especially. And uh, Medicine Jar is a simply a great rock song with a great hook. Fantastic lead guitar work from Jimmy uh, on that one. And, um, you know, proof right there that Wings was not just Paul's band. Um, number eight, just like it was with you, Alan, or your third song, Tomorrow. Tomorrow has to be in there. It's just, uh, you know, as catchy a song. It's delectable. <laughs> it's everything you'd ever want in, you know, three and a half minutes from Paul McCartney. One of those great piano based songs. And like I said earlier, love his vocals on it. Love the screaming at the end. One of the essential songs in, in uh, Paul's Wings catalog and, and post Beatles catalog. Tomorrow, you got to have that one on the list somewhere. I put Letting Go, the live version in there, although I do love the Venus and Mars studio version. But there's something about Wings Over America. One of the great things about that collection is that, and I'm sure Paul was planning this, so much of the material that he was writing back then was very suitable for performing live. And for whatever the reason, you know, there are times I prefer to hear Band on the Run material, Venus and Mars material, Speed of Sound material, when it's done live. It has a whole other life, a whole other vibe to it. Letting Go is just that. It's such a great song to do live. And very happy that he brought it back in recent years as part of um, <clears throat> his set list. You know, it's kind of funny what you said, Darren. Um, there's a lot of mine here that are rockers. And I usually almost always go for ballads. But um, I love Helen Wheels to death. And it's one of those songs that I put at the top of my list as songs that Paul has never done live before that I wish he would do live. It starts off with that great opening riff. Some of the greatest rock songs have a great opening riff and that's one of them. And I love the simple bass line that works so well with it and the harmonies. It's just um, <clears throat> overall an outstanding rocker. Um, number five is Venus and Mars Rock Show which as I said before, great opening to an album, perfect to open a concert with, love everything about it. Just Venus and Mars going into all those different sections that make up rock show and um, love the ending too, with the piano riff there, you know, and Paul just um, ad-libbing. Come on, we're going down to the rock show. Remember last week, blah, 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 blah. You know, I love all that stuff that he adds at the end. Uh, Venus and Mars Rock Show is the, the number five choice. Number four, none of us picked it. I'm kind of surprised. Live and Let Die, which I think is such a <clears throat> classic song. One of the great moments whenever you see Paul live. But the recording of it, I love the song. I love the melody. I love Paul's vocals. The arrangement that, that George Martin gives it is just so perfect. It's just outstanding for the song. It really sounds like a James Bond song. And it's definitely one of the best of the James Bond songs. Some people might say it is the best, but um, I have never, ever gotten tired of Live and Let Die. And as someone who listens to the radio still quite a lot more than I did when I was a teenager, I still hear Live and Let Die a lot and I, I never tire of it. You know, I'm always in the mood to hear it. Just an outstanding song and recording right there. Number three is Little Lamb Dragonfly, for all the reasons that I said before. Perfection at its best from McCartney, and coming up with an exquisite melody all throughout, flowing so well throughout six minutes, six minutes of bliss on that recording. <clears throat> and number two is my favorite A-side of a McCartney wing song, and that's Junior's Farm, which is another great rock song from him. Um, just think it's classic McCartney, great melody. Love the simple bass line going throughout it. I love the ending. It's one of the coolest endings when Paul like loses his breath at the very end. It's such a, you know, important part of the recording there. I hate when radio stations cut that off, yep. which they very often do. Like they don't even know how the song ends, but, um, and I love the screaming towards the end, that big build up there, the take me back part. So um, Junior's Farm is, is one of those songs, like Live and Let Die, I can never get tired of. Don't hear it that much on the radio, to tell you the truth. But, um, you know, it certainly deserves to still get airplay all the time, as far as I'm concerned. 
my number one choice is still, and it has been for many, many years, well, certainly from the Wings period anyway, is 1985. You can't get much better than what Paul's playing on the piano, the melody he wraps around it, the entire arrangement of it, everything I said before, coming back with Band on the Run at the end, um, all the horns coming in at the very end, the Tony Visconti arrangement there. Um, it's amazing. It's a truly remarkable recording. It could have been an A-side. In fact, it was a B-side, really. Um, wasn't it the B-side of Band on the Run? On the run. Yeah. The U.S. In the U.S., yeah. That's, that's insane. <laughs> <laughs> 1985 should have been an A-side. He could have had more hits off of Band on the Run, especially once you include Helen Wheels as the first hit in the U.S. But no, 1985 is another one of those songs of perfection. A Paul wouldn't change a hair about it and very glad that he brought it into his set list. It's now quite a long time, probably at least 10 years of playing 1985, I believe, in concert. So that's our top 10 list. And I'd love to know what you guys watching or listening to the show think. You can always write in with your own top 10 list of songs, wing songs, and your top 10 wings albums. Do you agree with us? Do you not agree with us? What do you feel about our comments? You can always write to us here at Things We Said Today. We'll give out all the contact information in just a moment. But um, this has been great discussing the whole Wings period of Paul's. And um, why don't we go around right now and tell everybody what's going on with us in our busy, busy lives and how they can get in contact with us. First of all, you, Darren. All right. Well, I'm at WFUV Radio Monday through Thursday nights starting at 10 p.m., not Fridays, Monday through Thursday, and Saturday afternoons 1 to 4 p.m. Uh, WFUV is at 90.7 FM uh, in New York City. Uh, also, you could stream us at WFUV.org, so you could listen anywhere and uh, get the app, download that, and listen there. Um, if you uh, want to send me a personal email, you can get me at WFUV. My name's spelled out, Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Uh, and I'm on Facebook, two Facebook pages. Um, if you come to Darren DeVivo, send me a friend request, the other page, click follow. Uh, either way, join them both and we'll be in touch with each other. Okay, very good. Alan? Okay, um, you can find me most easily on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, don't forget also to check the McCartney Legacy Facebook page. Um, get, you know, whatever new information we have about when the book's coming out. Um, and we sometimes we'll post, you know, other things, uh, you know, bits of... I guess as it gets closer to the book, we might start having, you know, excerpts and things. Um, you can contact all of us by email at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. Uh, it's at things we said fab. And we have two Facebook pages, things we said today, Beatles radio fans and just plain old things we said today. Um, we hope you're watching this on YouTube. And uh, if not, uh, you can get the audio only version on Podbeam or iTunes. Um, there were various other places too. And um, that basically is it. All right, very good. Thank you, Alan. As for me, uh, you can check out my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. You'll find a Beatles trivia and games page on there where every single week you can play along and win one of 10 great prizes. And almost every week, the prizes change there. It could be books, CDs, DVDs, you name it. And sometimes the trivia is very simple. Sometimes it's intentionally very challenging. But if you can, check out the website. Uh, KenMichaelsRadio.com. There's also a page in there for my syndicated radio show called Every Little Thing, which right now is on 55 radio stations. Tells you which stations, when they air them, links to their websites so you can stream them. And um, 
Yeah, it's, it's not a show that you can listen to on demand. You have to listen to as live broadcasts and live streams. So check out the Every Little Thing page on my website. Again, that's kenmichaelsradio.com. I do have another podcast show called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, which airs every other Monday night live on our YouTube channel, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Uh, the next show will be on Monday night which is May the 1st at 9 p.m. Eastern. Don't know what the topic is yet, but it's always interesting conversation. Uh, Kid O'Toole is there with me, as well as Tom Hunyadi and Joe Mayo. They're my co-hosts for that show. And what else do I have? Uh, oh, my own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio. Um, I do have, for the most part, conversations all about the Beatles, on that channel and most recently i had a guy on by the name of sean ross who is a radio veteran of a good 40 years and what he has done for most of his career is study radio all the trends in radio what formats work what nations there are what's not working what songs still get airplay what songs don't get airplay anymore he studied this he studies this stuff this is his livelihood this is what he's been doing and we did a whole conversation about whether or not radio still matters is it still relevant in this day and age in this day and age of streaming with spotify and apple music and youtube how important is radio still to this day and there'll be plenty more coming uh in the weeks ahead that's at ken michaels radio if you can please subscribe to that the talk more talk channel and of course our channel here at things we said today all right well this has been fantastic talking about wings i want to thank <laughs> my co-hosts darren devivo and alan cozen for this great conversation and like i said before let us know what you think um, you can always put comments here on our YouTube channel, write to us on all the different platforms that we're on. And so thanks so much for tuning in. And for Darren and Alan, I'm Ken Michaels, thanking all of you for watching. And as Paul would say at the end of every concert, see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>